Shalom um, Mishrala, when the start by giving no praise to Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai, double honors to the Apostle GMS and uh, to the Elder Apostle GMS, and only to the brothers doing the work in truth, what sincerity now. One thing you know, it's just, it's, I've been uh, meditating on is this whole abortion thing, man. You know, because you get all of these people that go, oh, so what if she's been raped? She's been. It's it's a thing. Uh, she's a victim of incest. That should that should surely be a reason um, to think about uh, to basically allow and accept uh, uh, abortion on those terms. Um, so I basically, you know, I, I did some of the research on the whole topic, and I'm just gonna read a few articles for you, cause um, cause man, it's if I can just go, you know, I'll, I'll save that for later. So this is basically um. A, a an article from this website that you can see here abortionfacts.com right and i'm going to jump down to uh this 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 uh paragraph here. you can read all of it if you wish but the most you know the first couple paragraphs are just preamble for the most part so it says the reason most people reach the wrong conclusion about abortion in cases of rape and incest is that the actual experience of sexual assault victims who became pregnant are, ru are routinely left out of the debate and why is that? Because ultimately, the elites are all about this, you know, destruction of 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 the uh, of the family. You know, they you know they they they, they want to take the world's population down from seven billion to five hundred million, and you know, this is a nice legal way that allows them to you know to do that. Okay. So, um, most people, including sexual assault victims who have never become pregnant, are therefore forming opinions based on prejudices and fears which are dis uh, disconnected from reality. For example, it is commonly assumed that rape victims who, come, who become pregnant would naturally want abortions. You know, and, and that's a good point, because, you know, whenever people bring up this argument against you, you know, um, that's, that's the... That's the uh, that's the main argument they come with well you know uh, lord's will you know i can bring out some facts that you know you can you can shut down anyone that comes with this whole uh you know rape incest this that and the other you know when it comes to abortion man because it's just it's murder man and for the most part you know because margaret sanger i'm going to put the video up at the end or beginning um of this video margaret sanger her thing was basically put the abortion clinics and all of that sort of stuff in the neighborhoods where where you know Jake lives you know because then that way that's always that's always a way out for them you know which is why the majority of you know abortion cases are Jake okay so um but in the only major study of pregnant rape victims ever done Dr. Sandra Muckhorn found that 75 to 85 percent chose against abortion this evidence alone should cause people to pause and reflect on the presumption that abortion is wanted or even best for sexual assault victims and i did you know because that's, that's the thing whenever you're looking up numbers you always have to you know check you know the sample group and the sample group for this was only like 79 people and it was done in 1979 so you know, take that one with a bit with a pinch of salt. But it goes on to say, says several reasons are given for not aborting. First, approximately seventy percent of all women believe abortion is immoral, even though many also feel it should be legal choice for others. That whole and you know, for the most part, it's that whole. Oh, if she's been raped, if it, she's an, uh, a victim of incest, this, that, and the other. You know, um, it says approximately the same percentage of rape victims believe abortion would be another act of violence perpetuated against their bodies and their children. Second, some believe that their child's life may have some intrinsic meaning or purpose which they do not yet understand. The child was brought into their lives by a horrible, repulsive act, um, but perhaps the Most High or Fate will use the child for some greater purpose. Good can come from evil. You know, because now, now they're going on that whole emotional thing of, oh, I raped this now and the other, but you know, according to the scriptures, you know, she, she's a virgin, she's not betrothed, and you, you deal with her however way you want. She's your woman. She can, she can try and cry about it, but she's your woman. You know, the only time uh, rape is going off is if she's, if she's actually someone's uh, wife, or if she's betrothed to someone, because then that becomes adultery. 
Okay, so it says, uh, what did I just, uh, okay, so it says, third, victims of assault often become introspective. Um, their sense of value of life and respect for others is heightened. They have been victimized and the thought that they in turn might victimize their own innocent child through abortion is repulsive. Fourth, at least at a subconscious level, the victim may sense that if she can get through the pregnancy, she will have conquered the rape. By giving birth, she can reclaim some of her lost self-esteem. Giving birth, especially when conception was not desired, is a totally selfless act, a generous act, a display of courage, strength and honour. It is proof that she is better than the rapist. While, while he was selfish, she can be generous. While he was destroying, she can be nurturing. So, you know, you, they got the emotive emotives in there to, to, to sway a perception. It says, if, if giving birth builds self-respect, what about an abortion? This is a question which most people fail to even consider. Instead, most people assume that an abortion will at least help a rape victim put the assault behind her and go on with her life. But in jumping to that conclusion, the public is adopting an uh, unrealistic uh, view of abortion. Uh, let me just let me just see if the jump straight down. Let's see if there's a okay. So, so I'll read this. This uh, paragraph says abortion involves a painful examination of a woman's sexual organs by a masked stranger who is invading her body. Once she's on the operating table, she loses control over her body. If she protests and asks for the abortionist to stop, um, she will likely be ignored or told it's too late to change your mind. This is what you wanted. We have to finish now. Because at this point, they've all ripped the baby up into shreds, man. Um, Slucky yeah. says, And while she lies there, tense and helpless, the life hidden within her is literally sucked out of her womb. The difference... In a sexual rape, a woman is robbed of her purity. Of her purity, in this medical rape, she is robbed of her maternity. You feel that? Okay. So it says a uh, second research shows that after any abortion, it, it is common for women to experience guilt, depression, feelings of being dirty, resentment of men, and lowered self-esteem. What is most significant is that these feelings are identical to what women typically feel after rape. Abortion then only adds to and accentuates the tra traumatic feelings associated with the sexual assault rather than easing the psychological burdens of the sexual assault victims. Abortion adds to them. It says this was the experience of Jackie Bakker who reports I soon discovered that the aftermath of my abortion continued a long time after the memory of my rape had faded. I felt empty and horrible. Nobody told me about the pain I would feel within causing nightmares and deep depressions. Okay. Okay, so, so the case against abortion of incest pregnancies is even stronger. Studies show that incest victims ra rarely... And listen to this, studies show that incest victims rarely ever voluntarily agree to an abortion. Instead of viewing the pregnancy as unwanted, the incest victim is more likely to see the pregnancy as a way out of the incestuous relationship because the birth of her child will expose the sexual activity. You know, so it says she is also likely to see in her pregnancy the hope of bearing a child with whom she can establish a true loving relationship one far uh, different from the exploitive relationship in which she has been trapped. But while the incest victim may treasure her pregnancy because it offers her hope of release and the hope of finding a nurturing love, her pregnancy is a threat to the exploiter. So, you know, it's <clears throat> so all this abortion thing, you know, people, like I was saying, people, you know, throw around this. Uh, this 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 belief that you know all incest victims want to get abortion. This is telling you that, you know, really and truly, all it does is it gives, um, it gives in you know, you know you you've heard the stories of oh yeah, mum's boyfriend did this that and the other. You know, all it does is it's helped to mask that. So, you know, whenever someone comes with that argument there, you just tell them, nah, on a level, that's that's not what I want. That's, you know. <laughs> um, 
For example, Edith Young, a 12-year-old victim of incest impregnated by her stepfather, writes, 25 years after the abortion of her child, throughout the years I've been depressed, suicidal, furious, outraged, lonely, and have left and have felt a sense of loss the abortion which was to be in my best interest because at the end of the day you're a young child you know you got this 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 old man uh you know someone someone like you're supposed to be like your father you know who's who who basically wants to hide his axe he doesn't want anyone knowing uh what what, what he's been getting up to he's gonna tell he's gonna tell that little girl look it's in the best interest you have to do this this that and the other yeah. Uh, yeah, and, that, and that's it on that. So now this is from um, this is data from the. Now let me just read it. In 1988, the Allen Guttmacher Institute conducted a survey of women who were getting abortions, asking why they had made this decision. They received responses from 1,900 women at 27 abortion clinics and three hospitals. The results were printed in Family Planning Perspectives, Planned Parenthood's magazine. Both the Guttmacher Institute and Planned Parenthood are pro-abortion. Right? So, when you look at these numbers, you can't say, ah, uh, you know, this is pro-life people who are, who are, uh, you know, trying to, you know, uh, fix the, the figures to make it look better on themselves to help argue against the, you know, the whole rape, uh, rape and incest argument. This is from pro-abortionists who who are bringing out this data, you know. And if you if you look if you look at the numbers here, um, okay. So it says woman is concerned about having about how having a baby could change her life. Sixteen percent. Woman can't afford a baby now. Twenty one percent. Woman has uh, problems with relationship and wants to avoid single parenthood. Twelve percent. But let me just get back, get back, get to the point. Woman was victim of rape or incest one percent right and if you look at the one down here it says um deformed baby less than three percent threat to life or health of mother maybe three percent rape and incest one percent mother has social problems 93 percent no because at the end of the day abortion is a totally selfish act you know and 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 you know who, who do you have to blame for that Esau, the so-called white man, the devil, the wicked. You know, he he's put he's put uh, women into this position where where they literally have power over life and death. If you was to um, if you was to kill a a, a woman with a child, that's double homicide. So why is it any different when a woman decides to go to a flipping abortion clinics? So this is a uh, fifty-four million five hundred and fifty-nine thousand six hundred and fifteen abortions since Roe versus Wade decision in nineteen seventy-three. Now you can look up that little um, court case there. It says a new estimate published by the National Right to Life Committee indicates that they have been an estimated fifty-four million abortions since the Supreme Court handed down its 1973 decision allowing virtually unlimited abortions. Although the March for Life took place today, yesterday was the 39th anniversary of, um, of, of that case. Now, if you... 55 million, let, let me put that into perspective. The population of the United States right now is around 330 million. 55 million people I mean 55 million babies have been murdered during that period of time you know if this was an African leader so so called who had killed 55 million people you, you, you think the US wouldn't have gone and you know brought out the whole military against this man Think this man wouldn't be down at flipping at the Hague for for crimes against humanity? If th this is this is a crime against humanity, fifty five million abortions since nineteen seventy three. You know, so uh, the analysis also found that the best estimate for the current number of annual abortions in the U.S. involving both surgical abortions. And procedures as well as the dangerous abortion drug RU486 is 
million 1.2 million abortions each year and this is just data for the United States this is just data for the United States so how about worldwide and the thing is in the next um, article I'm going to read um, it's basically just going to show you that although you know these numbers are there um, it, it's not that they're not actually full numbers so Governor Rick Perry um, marked his uh, marked the 38th anniversary of what he called the tragedy of the U of the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark rule, um, landmark Roe versus Wade decision, by speaking to fellow abortion opponents at the January 22 Texas rally for life outside the Capitol building. Perry said that since the 1973, which established abortion as a constitutional right, 50 million. 50 million children have lost their chances. That is a catastrophic number. All right? Uh, did, did, I, did I mark something out? So it says here. I mean, you can read the whole article, you know. Uh, it says, We also saw abortion numbers from other sources. Data from the CDC indicates indicate that there were 37.8 million abortions from 1973 through 2006. However, according to the CDC's website, states are not required to report abortion information uh, to the agency. So in some years, the numbers are incomplete. For example, the CDC's 2006 data do not include information on abortions in California, Louisiana or New Hampshire. And like I was saying, you know, um, that number could be significantly greater than the 50 something million you know and then they basically say down here we rate um perry's statement true you know and then i i remember um i've i've lost the data now but uh when i when i was basically looking up it was basically something like thirty-three thousand victims of of rape or something like that but 1.2 million babies are being aborted right, and now to jump onto the black woman right, so approximate number of African American deaths since 1973 based on statistics available from the US CDC like I said this number here the abortion number could be greatly higher than that it could be greatly higher than that because don't forget these are the same people that said only a few hundred people died in Panama, you know, when the U.S. went over there, when the numbers, you know, from independent research was, you know, found it was more like 2,000, when the U.S. was only saying around 500, you know, it's like how the U.S. is saying today, you know, only a couple, you know, a couple hundred thousand Iraqis are being killed in the Iraq war, when other institutes are saying, no, nah, it's more like a million, you know, because they always try to hide their wickedness, man, so AIDS, 292,000 violent crimes 306,000 you know so if you see that so you know they call our oh, niggas this niggas that killing each other yeah I mean 306,000 since um, 1973 that's a, that's a big number and it says just through to 2001 so like you know that's been 14 years since this um since this 11 million was 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 uh, you know was was given out you know, so violently, you know, talk about how niggas this, niggas that, 306,000. But wait, Esau, because of Esau, 11 million from 1973 to 2001, Jake children were killed. Like I said earlier on, if this was, um, this was Joseph Coney, uh, Robert Mugabe, uh, uh, Colonel Gaddafi and all of them, man. You know, they, 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 they'd be in the Hague right now, killing 11 million. In fact, you know, you'd have many more military bases in those countries. Because why? The US would have gone over there and said, oh, you're killing 11 million people. You've killed 11 million people um, in, in, in this period of time. You have to be put to death. Oh, well, not put to death, but we have to do something about you. And we, I mean, in, in, in Colonel Gaddafi's case, he was put to death. All right, so this is in 2012. There were more black babies killed by abortion 
31,328 in New York City then were born there, 24,758. The black children killed comprise 42.4%, 42, 42 the total number of abortions in the Big Apple. You know, this is just on black women, so imagine when you add in the Latin women as well. But like I said, who do you have to thank for this? You have the so-called white man to thank for this, man. 55 million. No. It says uh, Exodus, now you now start jump onto scriptures. It's Exodus 21 and 22. It says, if men strive and hurt a woman, that's lucky, and, and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follows, he shall be surely punished according to the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge is determined. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, and stripe for stripe. So what's that telling you? That's telling you plain and simple that a, a, a woman with child, I mean a life in, the, in a child's womb, in a woman's, it's a, 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 a baby in a uh, woman's womb is counted as life. Because what, you know, So I'll get up the next scripture. It says uh, Genesis 35 and 16. Uh, it says, And they journey from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. But his father called his name Benjamin, and Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is uh, Bethlehem. And I only brought that out to basically show you, you know, Rachel died giving birth. But the child survived, because that's what the Most High wanted. You know, if the woman's going to die from giving birth, that's what the Most High wanted. Because at the end of the day, the Most High is the one that... Uh, that basically he has the power of life and death. You know what I'm saying? So lucky I'm just looking up some numbers on my phone. Um, is that, that uh that um that I was basically saying? So it says it was a uh, thirty-two thousand rape pregnancies a year, right? So they basically like saying, ah, oh, yeah, you know. Well, what, if, what if the woman's a victim of rape, this, that, and the other? What, are these 32,000 rape pregnancies a year? But there are 1 million abortions. 1 million abortions, but 32,000. I mean, that's us. I mean, you feel me? Like, we, we, we read the, this statistic here. Rape and incest accounts for 1% of all abortions. This is just the US. So it says, Jeremiah 1 and 5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. You know, when I'm bringing that out, because, you know, you have these women, they think this because they're holding the baby, that they're the ones that, that are, 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 are the ark. That they basically think that it's, it's their child. No, it's the most high that created that, uh, that uh, child within you. You know? Because these women nowadays don't seem to understand, whereas in Second Maccabees 7 and 22, and this is a good read, especially considering the time that we're coming into, the whole chapter that is, you know, um, of the seven brothers and how they got tortured for this truth. It says, um, and I cannot tell how, this is uh, Second Maccabees 7 and 22, says, I cannot tell how you came into my womb, for I neither gave you breath nor life. Neither was it I that formed the members of every one of you, but doubtless the creator of the world who formed the generation of man and found out the beginnings of all things will also of his own mercy give you breath and life again, as ye, have now, as, as ye now regard not your own selves for his law's sake. You know, and that's, you know, reiterating the point that I made in Jeremiah 1 and 5. You know, because she had an understanding that actually these children came of me from the Most High. So just because you have a baby in your room, don't mean it's yours. 
It's the most high that gave you that child. And by you going to the abortion clinics and killing that child, you know, you're marked for death for that. That's murder. And you know what? That's that's why we have to deal with Esau. You know, so with that, I'm just uh, going to close up and say Shalom. Hope you brothers were edified and, you know, I'll, uh, I'll put the links up down there. You can do more research and, you know, if you find something of interest as well you can you know just post it up on the comment board and that sort of thing and um yeah and i mean cause like i was saying these these feminists man they'll try to push this shit on you but you know a lot of the time they're coming with that emotion man without any facts you know because going back to uh, you know going back to this the, the top of this one it says unfortunately most pro-lifers have difficulty answering these challenges because the issue of sexual assault pregnancies is so widely misunderstood you know especially them beta males as well you know they have women shouting the oh how can you say that what if she was raped what if it was incest well i've just given you the facts i've given you the numbers one percent of all abortions in the u.s alone you know so that's not that's not that's not factoring factoring in um you know uh, gook land over there that's not factoring in Africa that's not factoring in India that's not factoring in the UK just look at this number again 55 million this man's the devil man so that good brigade um brock the how brock the owl shy brock the how brock the owl shy brock the how brock the owl shy shallow I'm Michael Hitchborn, and this is the American Life League Report. The federal government already funnels hundreds of millions of dollars to Planned Parenthood every year, so it should come as no surprise when it funnels your money to celebrate its founder. The Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery recently opened a new, federally funded exhibit that, according to the museum's curator, celebrates women who have challenged and changed America over the past century. Included in the list is notorious liberal feminist Margaret Sanger. The National Portrait Gallery website provides a brief description of Sanger, describing a concerned crusader who fought with the courage of a wounded tiger for the promotion of birth control. What the Smithsonian exhibit fails to mention, however, is that Margaret Sanger founded the largest abortion chain in the country, now known as Planned Parenthood. But the exhibit also fails to explain the racist ideology behind Sanger's promotion of birth control. Many people don't really know what eugenics is. Eugenics is defined as belief in the possibility of improving the qualities of the human species by discouraging reproduction by persons having genetic defects or presumed to have inheritable, undesirable traits. Essentially, eugenics is the creation of a master race by controlling who has children and who doesn't. An article appearing in the January 31, 1922 edition of the New York Times bore the headline, Mrs. Sanger says Superman is the aim of birth control. If creating a race of supermen is the goal, who did Sanger believe had genetic defects or undesirable traits that stood in the way? In his book, Birth Control, Facts and Responsibilities, Adolf Meyer quoted an essay Sanger wrote in 1925, entitled, The Need of Birth Control in America. Birth control is not merely an individual problem. It is not merely a national question. It concerns the whole wide world the ultimate destiny of the human race. In his last book, Mr. H.G. Wells speaks of the meaningless, aimless lives which cram this world of ours. Hordes of people who are born, who live, yet who have done absolutely nothing to advance the race one iota. Their lives are hopeless repetitions. All that they have said has been said before. All that they have done has been done better before. Such human weeds clog up the path, drain up the energies and the resources of this little earth. We must clear the way for a better world. We must cultivate our garden. In 1922, Sanger wrote a book entitled The Pivot of Civilization, 
In it is a chapter called The Cruelty of Charity, where she blasts programs that provide medical and nursing facilities to slum mothers as insidiously injurious. In the same book, Sanger called for the cessation of charity, for the segregation of morons, misfits, and the maladjusted, and for the sterilization of genetically inferior races. She also argued that organized attempts to help the poor was the surest sign that our civilization has bred, is breeding, and is perpetuating defectives, delinquents, and dependents. The Birth Control Review was Sanger's official publication for the American Birth Control League, and in 1932, she outlined her plan for peace. The main objectives of the Population Congress would be to apply a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population whose progeny is already tainted, to give certain dysgenic groups in our population their choice of segregation or sterilization, and to apportion farmlands and homesteads for these segregated persons where they would be taught to work under competent instructors for the period of their entire lives. Sanger's admiration for the eugenics programs of Nazi Germany were well known at the time. In 1933, the Birth Control Review published Eugenic Sterilization, an Urgent Need, by Ernst Rudin, who was Hitler's director of genetic sterilization and the founder of the Nazi Society for Racial Hygiene. In her praise for the eugenics programs in Germany, Sanger called for the implementation of such programs in the United States, specifically targeting African Americans. The following editorial was published in the 1932 issue of the Birth Control Review. The Negro problem is one of the most complicated and important confronting America. Whatever the ultimate answer may be, such an attitude brings to light the function of birth control as a necessary agency in its solution. The present submerged condition of the Negro is due in large part to the high fertility of the race under disastrously adverse circumstances. Thus, the question arises, to what extent birth control has had a eugenic effect upon the Negro race? If any question should remain about Sanger's racist agenda, a 1939 letter she wrote to Dr. Clarence Gamble should remove all doubt. We should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social service backgrounds and with engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is a man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Can there be any wonder why Planned Parenthood opens its facilities in poor inner city neighborhoods populated by minorities? Can there be any doubt that Sanger's philosophy of creating a pure race is what fuels Planned Parenthood's support of embryonic stem cell research? Margaret Sanger was a racist. She's responsible for the millions of babies that have been ethnically cleansed from our country and should not be celebrated by the taxpayer-funded Smithsonian. Please visit the website and contact the Smithsonian demanding that materials on Sanger be removed from the exhibit. For American Life League, I'm Michael Hitchborn.